Okay, we're taking a look at Chapter 10 on the Nursing Management of Dementia. In this whole learning plan itself, we'll look at dementia, depression, and delirium. Really, the focus of this chapter is on dementia. We're going to look at the stages. There's three stages and some similarities of clinical features. We're going to look at how a person is truly diagnosed with dementia. This has come a long way introduce you to the common causes of delirium, discuss some of the theoretical foundations of how do we care for these people with dementia, and look at some of the pharmacology that's available as well as our non-pharmacologic interventions. Really want to look at these nursing interventions because it's about symptoms. Really, they've, they've even changed the terminology that we're not calling it behavioral anymore. It's the symptoms of dementia. Looking at the adult day services that are popping up and also when can palliative and hospice care come in to assist um, those family members that are caring for the dementia person at home and in facilities as well. A lot of big key terms and a lot of what we're looking at is the brain itself and the proteins and plaques as well as the drugs. Um, but terms that you'll be reading about, we'll be talking about through this um, lecture. All right. So by definition, dementia is progressive, degenerative, irreversible function. And we see differences in their memory. Usually what is an early sign is some short-term memory losses, um, difficulty concentrating, depending on the type of dementia that they have, language skills um, change, visual spatial skills, they can't reason, and then why this interferes with the person's daily functioning. Watch that video clip I have for you um, from ABC on dementia, and you can see how that change in cognition really affects the daily functioning. It is not considered a normal part of aging, although the statistics over 85 are quite high that we'll be talking about. So your book does a nice job talking about the different type of dementias and how people are labeled. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common. We see this in 60 to 80 percent of the cases. We're finding much more um, about the vascular type dementia right now. Vascular dementia is um, back to the Alzheimer's disease. With the Alzheimer's disease, the profound changes we see are what we call amyloid protein plaques and neural fibrillate tangles. And so this causes neural death. And really where we see a lot of this at is up in the hippocampus. And this is in the part of the brain where learning and memory are stored. So if this is affected, people don't learn as well so maybe they're in the early stages and we've talked about teaching this becomes a real issue of what is that retention and again short-term memory the long-term memory stays more intact because um, of the way memory is utilized in memory many parts of the brain to get that memory back short-term is um, most often affected they can tell you things from the past, life review. Um, they kind of go back to the past and lose all that short-term current memory. Vascular dementia, we are learning so much more about right now. There's huge, a phenomenal study being done at the University of Madison in regards to this. Um, we do know that um, vascular dementia, the second most common time, is... Um, genetic and component, also follows history of coronary artery disease, looking at proteins, um, also a genetic component to this which is really scary. It's near and dear to my heart. My mom had vascular dementia associated with um, what we'll talk about these frontal temporal lobe dementias and um, it was very traumatic um, to have lived with someone and when it's your family you can be the nurse and as smart as you want to be but how you miss signs um, early on especially if you're not near that person all the time 
We also know that people are having the mixed dementia. They're having the Alzheimer's disease type as well as the vascular associated dementia. So we really want to get with that vascular dementia. We worry about our people with diabetes because they die of cardiovascular disease, our stroke patients, high triglycerides, all those problems. We do know that there's a, a Parkinson's type dementia um, where we see motor function go early, cognition later. We've also identified Lewy body, more motor involvement early, problem with Lewy body dementia. Also, they will have um, visual hallucinations. We see a lot of personality changes with the Lewy body, saying really inappropriate things. Um, which is very hard. Now that we um, are learning more about frontal lobe dementia, this has really come to the forefront when we're talking about the NFL and having the problems um, from head traumas and, and knowing and learning more about the parts of the brain. The brain has just become this untapped area that um, we just haven't known much about. With that frontal lobe, we see um, can't make decisions, but their memory's kind of still there. A lot of personality changes, see a really marked decline early in language, difficulty walking, poor coordination, um, doing and saying things much earlier than um, the Alzheimer's type. So as we learn more about the brain, we're, we're learning more about how each lobe is affected. So you want to look at some risk factors. And age in itself, like we said, it's not a consequence of aging. However, for every five years old, over 65, that rate or increase goes up. And the research is showing of what we know is that approximately half the people over age 85 have some form of those types of dementias that we talked about, whether it be a Parkinsonism, more seen in vascular problems. Family history, um, this just scares me and why I have such an interest in dementia is I've had a first and second generation, both women, both with the same cardiac history that I, I'm developing with um, vascular type dementia. So they've alienated the genetic factor. Um, they say that if you have that first degree relative, and again, back to that football, what we're seeing is that history of head trauma and all these cases for concussions in the NFL, vascular disease. Severe infections, the meningitis, things that can actually um, have m cognitive changes even though you get better from it, but they're finding they believe that even some infections can trigger it. It is a true medical diagnosis, and there is a box on page 382 that talks about the diagnostic criteria. <coughs> Excuse me impaired short and long term. No longer um, are able to function from abstraction, um, planning, they have uh, language disturbances or what we call aphasia, apraxia, they um, later on lose that purposeful movement. Agnosia is they have the ability to recognize sensory stimuli too. It's a gradual onset with continued decline. If someone has delirium, we don't see these changes. So um, they do say the best thing is to get to a provider that knows the person and can make those decisions if it isn't related to a medication or a disease process or something else that is occurring that can cause these type of changes. Another thing that's very interesting that, that we're learning about, and I have a website out there that, that um, brief introduction to the stages, but there are stages of diagnosis that, um, that people are labeled that we're through. The box on page 386, it's box 10-9, talk about those characteristics, and there's no set way time frame that individuals go through these stages. We 
seem to see it a little bit quicker with the vascular type and the frontal lobe. So again, in those early stages, maybe they can't find the car, maybe they're leaving something on the stove and forgot they put it on, um, that getting lost in familiar places, and then as they move on, then it's language and numbers. And, and um, I can remember my mom laughing, I can't remember your phone number. And my mom had just this incredible mind for memorying um, those type of things. And in retrospect, looking back, um, what we missed, um, you know, some hallucinating and, and uh, not recognizing my father so much at time and we didn't know if it was her stroke and, and if it was really the dimension where we were at with a multitude of things going on. There is pharmacologic invent, um, intervention. Again, I believe the from what I've seen them in action, they either work or they don't. We have the cholinesterase inhibitors and the N. MDA receptor agonist, the most common one is the Nemenda. Um, that cholinesterase is what we call is the Aricept. Now, these work or they don't, un unfortunately, they can have some side effects too. So you have to look, is, is, is there a better intervention or some way that we can structure that person's day better that whatever may be a trigger to some of the behaviors that we see, that we don't have to medicate them. Um, early on, Aricep can make people really tired. And so, you know, the timing of the day you give it because is the behaviors more at night or in the day? You know, maybe they should take it at bedtime instead of the morning. Dual medications that can cause confusion, some of the confusions that we see in dementia, possibly delirium, are the anticholinergics. That, again, is a Beer's Criteria medication. Any medications that affect the central nervous system. So, again, it, it really is looking at all of the medications they're on and getting rid of what we can. I do have a ton of resources out there on the website. I really want you to take some time after you've read that really will um, gear you in the right direction and help you. Now, unfortunately, we do have people with dementia that can get delirium on top of it. Delirium is identified as a group of symptoms. It is reversible. It can develop over hours and days. They can be really hyper alert or to the point of hypoactive. If you have someone with dementia, one of the, the types, and you get them in the hospital, the environment has changed, the rhythm has changed, everything has changed, they might be ill, and they become hyper alert and go into, um, into what we call a delirium state. Now again, I have that excellent um, video clip about that doctor talking about 10 reasons although it's seen more in the ICU, we see this on the general medical floors. So one of the best interventions where we look at with this is to do the uh, confusion assessment method, and I have that available for you to review. And what we want to look at is that if it's acute, if it's fluctuating, um, is this new disorganized thinking, is there an altered level of consciousness? So when we're doing our assessments, it's really important to get a full level of consciousness versus alert and oriented. And what is that person's alert and oriented baseline? And why has that level of consciousness changed? Because we know delirium is caused by something environmental or systemically, the first goal then is we want to treat the cause eliminate the cause, change that environment, do what we can. And the book has wonderful interventions and um, we really are starting to do well at the hospital. We have Dr. Punky available. She will see clients. She will make recommendations because we are seeing that this is extending length of stays. And it is also decreasing opportunities to be placed in assisted living or in nursing homes because of the behaviors. 
when they're evaluated. So that becomes just such a problem. Early on in the phase, we do see a lot of depression, especially with the dementia. If people um, are diagnosed, if they know, um, symptoms of depression can really overlap with dementia. So we want to be aware that, that we're looking and we know these people. And this is where, if possible, as challenging as they can be, that the same staff work with these people to keep consistency that we can decrease some of that anxiety and agitation because if they're confused over and above their dementia or if they have delirium, those behaviors will exacerbate and we can minimize this as well. Depression is extremely untreated. Many don't meet um, the true diagnostic criteria. Your book talks about 20% living out in the home are depressed as many as 40 that we know of in nursing homes. Again, this is a very um, under-researched area. As we care for the persons with dementia, we have to look at the theories behind it. We look at both behavioral and psychological symptoms. So we want to really, um, again, those are symptoms, not behaviors. We're trying to give a behavioral approach but again, manage those symptoms. Attempt pharmacological treatment where we can't get them off medications they don't need to be on. Again, of watching those beer criteria medications. Non-pharmacologic treatment of the environment that's appropriate for them. One of the things, if, if they're a quiet person, music alone can be enough to overstimulate so it is important to know who these people were when they were healthy. Ask family what did they like to do. Pain management. Some of the behaviors that we see are because the person's in pain and they can't respond on 0 to 10 what kind of pain I'm having. So again, it's, it's getting to know your clients, looking for those um, different cues, facial grimacing, knuckling, um, frowns, furrow lines, you know, what, what is an indicator? And does their disease have pain? They're, they get to the point they can't describe it. Keep people busy. If they're up wandering because they want to fold clothes, there's nothing wrong with allowing them to fold the towels. It's an excellent intervention. Communication interventions, learn how that person communicates. They may have had deficits prior, which are only going to be worse. Be consistent with these interventions for behavior. If, if you're going to take someone to shower and they're hitting at you, you have to even watch your approach if it's hand over, hand under. There is that hand-in-hand -hand tool kit out there for you to assist in these matters. Actually, a lot of the additional resources are probably even better than the textbook it providing you what you need. <clears throat> we are seeing an influx of adult day services available because the caregivers of dementia people, many still have to work. We're seeing dementia affecting much younger, especially with the vascular dementias, um, frontal lobe dementias, Lewy body dementias are younger, that um, for them to remain in the home, family needs to work, and daycare settings um, and services really can help. Um, even taking them there to an adult daycare um, versus what other assistance can we get in the home. Now, unfortunately, much of this is not covered unless they have a phenomenal insurance plan um, to keep them at home. But for some people, if they don't want to institutionalize or have someone live in a, in a nursing home or assisted living, this may be cost effective in comparison. Again, uh, hopefully we've got all our people involved with advanced directives in, in the planning of end of life care earlier. But um, there is criteria that people near the end stage of dementia do qualify for hospice and they may even qualify for palliative care under their insurance and as defined by palliative care so we want to get them in earlier. 
thank goodness we know enough about this now. And with the cost in nursing homes, there is legislation that has been put into place at the federal level that we want to um, improve research as well as health service delivery, which does include keeping these people in their home because the more familiar with the environment, the decrease we're seeing in behaviors. So as stated, 80, you know, half of people age 85 and older have some form of dementia. We do know that we have really good um, confusion assessment scales, um, better ways to diagnose dementia than we've ever had before, that we are getting grounded and have wonderful interventions for common behavioral problems, which in long-term care, because of this um, evidence-based practice, we are seeing some wonderful, um, just phenomenal increase in the service that we provide.